Добрый вечер. Здравствуйте, товарищи. Сегодня в Москве продолжила работу первая сессия Верховного Совета СССР. Hello, comrades, and welcome back to the Shanka Show. Today, as I promised, we will talk about Soviet TV, uh, TV programming during the Soviet Union. And, of course, this is a huge topic, and we can talk for hours. But in this video today, I would like just to touch a little bit some topics that I remember as a kid uh, about Soviet TV. And then if you have any more questions, uh, please post it below this video so we can look together and talk into details, uh, more in details about Soviet TV uh, stations and TV programs. To summarize the Soviet television, there's uh, several basic things I can think of right away. First of all, number one, we did not have any commercials. So that's almost like we say the only positive thing about Soviet TV. There was no commercials whatsoever. And I actually remember the very first time I experienced a TV commercial. And that was in the early 90s when we just started having private TV stations. So the very first private TV station in Kiev, they didn't have their own programming yet. So they just started um, translating satellite uh, TV station from England. I believe it used to be called Super Channel. I'm not sure if it exists anymore. So for me, there was like the window into the other world got open. I was sitting there by hour, for hours, you know, watching that uh, super channel, listening to the language. I know there was uh, music videos and news. And uh, I remember that one time uh, they were playing some American movie. There was a Western show. So there was a cowboys, train, robbers, you know, all the good stuff. So I'm all that kind of watching the movie, trying to understand English, because at that time my English was pretty poor. And suddenly, show stopped, and they started playing commercials. And I remember that was like a real shock for me. I was just couldn't believe my eyes and ears. For me, it was like a real crime to stop the movie and started showing commercials like i would understand okay you play commercials before the movie and maybe after the movie but stopping the movie right in the middle of the action and start showing some advertising about toothbrushes or something else cars i remember i was really deeply disturbed so the soviet union didn't have any commercials the second thing about soviet tv it was extremely boring As I mentioned uh, earlier, that as a kid, parents, uh, you know, they didn't have, they weren't concerned about me sitting at home and watching TV all day while they're at work because it was literally nothing to watch. During the day, the programs were just showing maybe some theoretical performance in some theater, or maybe ballet dance, or classical music concert, or maybe some report about. Uh, successes in some collective farm so it was literally nothing to watch like entertaining wise so no kids were sitting watching tv like you know now you can watch cartoons 24 7 and even in the middle of the night there'll be some cartoon on some channel at that time since it was all government owned and there was no bringing any cash flow i mean tv was pretty much expense for the government so they were spending very little on entertaining and they just used it as the tool for the propaganda which brings us to the third topic of the news program called Vremya Programa Vremya or the news program Time if you watch my channel you, sh you know by now that I used to live in Kiev which is the capital of Ukraine or at that time that was the capital of Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic so we had a total of three TV channels, of course, they all were on air, over the air transla uh, transmission. We had no cable. Uh, I mean, it was talking early 80s, late 70s. So, the first channel was uh, so-called uh, Central Television, Central Television. So, that was the program from Moscow. And that was a central TV station for whole country. Then, uh, in areas there'll be some local tv so in ukraine we had 
UT1, украинское телевидение, Ukrainian Television Station 1, and UT2, Ukrainian Television uh, Number 2. So, two local Ukrainian channels and one central channel. And at 9 o'clock at night, all three channels would be playing the news from Moscow, Programma Vremia, the time news program. And we even had a lot of jokes about it. And actually, one of my viewers kind of stole my thunder by posting that joke, is that when a guy turns TV at 9 o'clock and he sees the program news in a время, so he switches from channel number one to channel number two, and it's the same thing, same program, same news. He switches to channel number three, same thing, same news. He switches to channel number four, and there is a KGB officer looking at him like very suspiciously. It's like, I would stop switching channels and I'll start watching the news. So that was the joke about um, that you had to watch the news or just turn TV off. There would be no other option to watch just the Programma Vremia at 9 o'clock. And it would be from 9 till 9.45, uh, I believe. So for 45 minutes, there'll be state news on every channel. So this is the sounds of the news program time that every Soviet citizen will hear every day at 9 p.m. Moscow time. And it was live news. So sometimes there'll be some uh, silly things happening when, you know, people go live, but not often. And there'll be a standard way of presenting news. First of all, there'll be official news from the government about uh, maybe Brezhnev meeting some leaders of other countries or some uh, party meetings happening in Moscow about uh, our successes, about the new uh, party um, targets or aims for the country. After that, there'll be news uh, from all over the Soviet Union. So there will be some reports about harvest, uh, how the things go on in collective farms, or how the fishermen uh, catching a lot of fish, um, maybe something news about the Soviet army. Then we'll have some news about overseas, America, and other you know, world news. And of course, all our news will be good news, and the most news from overseas maybe be bad news. So I don't remember ever till uh, Gorbachev started Perestroika and Glasnost, which Glasnost is kind of hard thing to translate, but openness. So they started telling a little bit more real news, but there was never reported any train crash or airplane lane crash. Like in Soviet Union, everything was great, but they always would show anything happen in United States or in the Western Europe, you know, train hit the bus or whatever things happen once in a while, unfortunately, or air crash. But in Soviet Union, everything was always good. Then after and those news, we'll have sports. There will be quite a bit uh, of time dedicated to sports. And after that will be uh, weather uh, for the next uh, couple of days. And uh, Soviet Gidramit Center, there was a company, I won't call it a company, but the place that they predicted the weather, they were famous for being really horrible about weather prediction, so there was always a lot of jokes about how poor uh, was weather prediction in the Soviet Union, and actually it took me a while after I moved to the United States to get used to, to like, believe that if it is a bright sunshine, uh, and they say in three hours you're going to have rain, I took me a while after I got wet and my kids got wet and got scared by a thunderstorm to start believing the forecast, because in Soviet Union... If there is a bright sunshine and they promise you a sunny day, you better, better bring, bring the umbrella with you. Now, my family uh, had two TVs. I mean, not at once, but in the beginning, I remember we used to have a small black and white TV made in Ukraine. It was called Slavutich. And that was a you know, really small screen, maybe, I don't know, 13-inch diameter. And so it was black and white, and you had this funky manual a channel switch, like a clunker style. So every time you need to walk to TV, of course, it didn't have a remote. And then you have go click, click, click to change the channels. And we didn't have a color TV till, I believe, 1985 or 86 for quite a while. And actually, the Soviet um, TV 
started translating uh, in color only from 1977. So in 1977, Soviet television went 100% color. And they had about total of 200 million viewership. So it's another thing, I don't say nice thing about Monopoly. If you have one TV channel, there'll be a lot of viewers because there's nothing else to watch. And I recall uh, when we went to visit my uncle, which is my mom's brother, and he was quite a bit older, like 15 years old or so, and they had a color TV. So I kind of remember when we came to visit, just to watch TV in color, it was just amazing just how bright it was because I used to watch in black and white. So that was those little snippets how cool of color TV can be. And then, as I said, around 1985, my parents um, decided to buy a color TV. And those were super expensive at that time. The price was around 600 rubles. So my parents were making around 250 rubles a month. So it's like three months combined income of the family. So if you say average American family maybe makes... You know, on a lower scale, $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month, so times three. So paying close to, you know, seven to $10,000 per TV. Um, so they bought it and there was a brand called Electron. It had a bigger screen, maybe 19 inch in diameter. And it was advanced uh, channel switch. So you still didn't have a remote. You had to walk to TV to switch channels. But it was just the electronic buttons you push to cha change the channel. So that was pretty cool. So for kids, there were only two programs that they will be interested to watch during the weekdays. At 8 o'clock, Moscow time, Kiev time, there will be Goodnight Kids program. And it was translated from Moscow. It was for 15 minutes. And it was always a little... Uh, I don't say toys, but you'll see on this picture. So there'll be uh, three characters and the lady who'll be running the show. So there'll be a little piglet, Hryusha, little dog, Fila, and a little crow, uh, Varona. So they will have a little, you know, conversation, discussing some situations, and then they'll come up with, you know, a little story that, okay, if you're honest kid, then you're a good kid, and you'll always be successful. And if you try to cheat someone or something you're gonna you know pay consequences and you'll get in trouble so fila as a uh, dog he's really kind of like honest but a little bit slow hryusha you know being a pig uh so always gets himself in trouble and kind of naive and then of course a little crow will always create troubles and then they'll play a little cartoon for about 10 minutes so that'll be 15 minutes Good night, kids. Uh, program from Moscow, of course, on Russian language. Then in Ukraine, they will have Nadobranich Malata Diti. So that's the same name, Good Night Kids, but on Ukrainian. So that will be from 8:45 till 9 o'clock. Also, 19 minute, uh, 15 minutes program. And sometimes it'll be just a guy telling some story without cartoon, or sometimes it'll be a little story and cartoon. And interestingly, we have um, this person that was really good about telling uh, fair tales. And there's a lot of uh, funny stories going on about him. And he's the Ukrainian guy that kids loved his the way he was telling the stories, but he was always going live. And quite often he would come show up at the studio drunk. So one time he was telling the story. And it's about a little rabbit, you know, and wolf, I believe, or no, probably fox. So fox cheated the rabbit, stole money or carrots, whatever. And so the, the story goes that the rabbit sat down and started crying. So he kind of mentioned like an F word trying to explain how hard the, the little rabbit was crying and went live. So after that, they pulled him off the show for a while, but it was a huge upset, like everyone asking, you know, sending letters to TV station, uh, please bring him back. 
and they in the end brought him back. So that became like a famous story about him. You know, say that the poor little rabbit was f crying <laughs> really bad. Then on Sundays, we'll have a hour long program, and I'll be of Gostyahu Skarsky. It's like visiting the fair t- store, uh, country of fair tales, and there'll be again the lady uh, having some kind of presentation. They'll play the long cartoons, long stories. So that was the only time that you can be glued to our TV for a long time as a kid is watching Gostyahu Skarsky program on Sunday. And once in a while there'll be other little programs for kids, but as I said. For the kid, it was hardly anything to watch because, uh, as I said, it was only 15 minutes uh, Russian uh, program for kids and then 15 minutes, so 30 minutes on the weekdays and hour and a half on the weekends on only Sunday. They'll be the only things the kids could watch. So the, for kids, TV wasn't really a big deal. There was no issues for parents to, you know, kick the kids outside, like, hey, go play outside, stop watching TV, because there was nothing to watch, so we were outside playing. Usually, every newspaper in Soviet Union would publish uh, what's going to be going on on TV for next week, and uh, I think daily there'll be also a little a part just saying what's going to be on TV tomorrow, and it wasn't much, as I said, only had three channels, and I don't remember exactly what time the whole show started. I believe around 8 or 9 o'clock It's when TV will start. And I said we usually were at work, so no one was watching TV. In the evening, there could be a big, a long sports program. So we'll be showing live maybe some soccer or ice hockey. Those were the most popular sports in Soviet Union. Uh, football. We call it football, but, you know, that was soccer and ice hockey. So that could be going on. So, for example, if the team's playing in Moscow, you know, they'll be showing sports on first channel on central television. And if you, Ukrainian local team's playing somewhere in Ukraine, then they'll show that on the Ukrainian um, uh, channel UT1 or UT2. And, of course, there'll be a lot of, as I mentioned already, theater performances, ballet or singing. I remember at least Ukrainian television, and maybe Russian television was doing the same, central television, but from like 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there'll be no programming at all on TV. All they do, they'll show this weird-looking picture, which supposedly you, you can use to adjust the picture of your TV. So there'll be this annoying beeping sound, because if you leave your TV on... And it's a steady f- picture. It supposedly can mess up your screen. So there'll be this annoying sound like me for an hour. And there'll be this picture that you can adjust the settings of your TV for the color and shades and have it all aligned because that old technology, the TV tubes, sometimes the so-called that electron gun will go, go a little bit off scale. So you can tweak it a little bit to improve the picture so for an hour every day there'll be just that picture on a screen so as i said no one cared about the cost of the tv time because there was no commercials no price for advertising so yeah they could afford just to have that they call it setka the net for the screen corrections just to show it for the whole hour every day there are other, also other uh, TV programs I would like to mention that we were quite popular. Well, they won't be popular if we had more choice, but every Sunday we have a one-hour program called Služu Sovjetskomu Sejuzu, which is, uh, it was a story about the Soviet Army and Soviet Red uh, Air Force and Fleet. And they'll be, you know, showing different uh soldiers or different stories about how great the Soviet army is doing and how they do maneuvers and training and uh, maybe a story about a specific uh, person you know he got um, because we have a draft so everyone had to serve except uh, people who went to college 
and there will be two years if you go to Army or Air Force and uh, three years if you go to fleet and uh, you didn't have a choice I don't think they will just uh, draft you and say okay you go to fleet or you go you're a short guy you should be in a tank or a submarine you know something like that and also kind of interesting that was one of the way the government was mixing up the people in Soviet Union because for example if they draft someone in Ukraine he end up serving his uh, term somewhere in the far Siberia or somewhere in Asia. Like my father, for example, uh, he spent two years in Baltic states, I think in Latvia. In the same time, they will send people from Georgia or Armenia to serve their uh, military term in Ukraine. So, of course, you know, soldiers, when they have a leave time, they'll go out, and maybe start dating, and they maybe marry a local girl. So that way... It was a little bit of mixing up going on because generally, and that's, I think, the huge difference between, for example, like America and uh, I'm talking United States and Soviet Union, because of all this Propiska uh, situation, as I told the story before, that you were kind of like locked in in your uh, place, in your town or your city, people didn't move much at all. Um, so it wasn't much going on activity, like I believe in the United States, it considers one of the good signs of economy when people move a lot. And in Soviet Union, people didn't move much at all. So the one of the way of mixing up kind of people, because the idea was to have one Soviet nation, not, you know, Ukrainians, Russians, Belarusians, it would be just Soviet people. That would be, as only explanation, one people in Ukraine end up uh, having served their military Terms and were in Tajikistan, and then guys from Tajikistan showed up in Belarus or Ukraine. We also had a very popular music show. It was only for 30 minutes from 11 o'clock in the morning to 11.30 on Sundays, and it was called uh, later in 80s. It had different names, but I remember it being called Utrinya Pochta, Morning Mail. And they will show video clips, like music video clips, uh, mostly, of course, Soviet singers. And once in a while, uh, video music, uh, video clips from, like, Eastern Europe. And once in a great while, maybe they'll show, like, ABBA or somebody else. So that would be a big thing. I really like that show and all my friends, too. And I remember on Sundays, that was my, uh, one of my chores was to vacuum our apartment. And I remember always begging my mom uh, to let me watch my uh, morning mail show and then I will vacuum the apartment. So that was a really popular entertainment uh, for Soviet people is to watch this music show on Sunday, Utrinya Pochta. Another uh, very popular Sunday uh, TV show was Klub Putyashestnikov. It's like a Travelers Club, and that had a lot of jokes and sarcasm about that show, because the name of it was like the club of, you know, travelers, but Soviet people really didn't travel, because you couldn't just say, oh, I would like to go and visit, you know, France or visit Germany, it was pretty much impossible. Uh, we had two kinds of passports, so everyone had passport it's like your personal ID with, you know, driver's license wasn't cut in it. Everyone, every person in Soviet Union, when you turn 16, you get a passport. Except peasants in the villages, they were passportless till like 70s. So your document, like it's your main ID was a passport, but it was a, only was for inside of Soviet Union. And as a document which has your picture, had your uh, nationality, so Ukrainian or Russian or Belarusian Jewish, had information of your birth, your parents, then also had a stamp uh, with your prapiska where you live, like permission where you permitted to live pretty much. And all also it had a stamp about your marital status. So if you get married, you'll have a stamp in your passport and says that you got married on such a day to such a person. And that was one of the ways that girls, if they date in a guy and 
you know, they like him and you kind of like, if you're thinking about having sex with him and of course at that time, most girls, you know, you'll have to marry me if we go that far. They'll ask for a password, passport to take a look and show me your passport because in passport, it will say if you married or you're single. And that was the way the girls can see if the guy is married, then of course there's, there's no way. But if you're single, then maybe we will um, let you have some fun because then you're serious and you want to marry me. But if you want to travel abroad, you should get a special different passport. That was uh, only for traveling out of the country and you couldn't just go and ask for it. Uh, I remember when I got mine in middle of 90s, it was required that you get a paperwork from person someone is inviting you to come over so for example if i had a friend in germany then they had to send me a paper says yeah i'm inviting this person to visit me and then you take the paper and show like hey i have a friend or whatever relative that wants me to visit them i would like to get a passport for traveling abroad and then they're gonna decide if they let you have that passport or not they're gonna contact your work and verify that you don't have some clearances that you know some state secrets, uh, stuff like that. So it was extremely hard to travel out of the country. So we were all people complaining that this club of travelers, the show that we watched wasn't really a club of travelers because the only person who traveled was the person who had that show going, uh, Mr. Sienkiewicz. The rest of us were just watching it. And I was complaining like, we would like to actually see the world with, through our own eyes not through the eyes of Sienkiewicz. There was a famous saying, because the whole country was traveling all over the world through the eyes of this uh, show uh, host, not, we weren't really travelers ourselves. So there were other programs. Uh, there was a couple more music programs we had. Um, every time uh, when we celebrated New Year, as I mentioned before, it was the biggest Pretty much holiday in Soviet Union is New Year celebration, Nova God. Uh, so there'll be a music program with all the celebrities, you know, singers and performers gathering together and call Goluboya Ganyog, Blue Flames. Uh, so that was once a year. It was a long TV program for hours, uh, tr you know, transmitted from Moscow. And there was also a program about animals, Miri Zhivotnik. Uh, was international panorama was like one hour overview of different events that are going on in the world and of course there was through the party prism how the communist party saw the events um, as I said but generally uh, Soviet TV was extremely boring and of course they were showing movies and they had a couple it's hard to say there were TV shows but there were some shows that were going on but not like years and years but maybe they have like 13 episodes or 20 episodes uh, we'll uh, cover them later but this is the short overview of the soviet uh, tv in uh, late 70s early 80s i hope you enjoyed the show and we'll talk to you later have a good one goodbye